Today is an important day. <laughs> we are wrapping up our study in 1 John. Now, how many of you have a bulletin with you right now? Raise your hand. Good. How many don't have a bulletin in hand? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. All right. They need a bulletin. Because, you know, I was a professor for a short while. Actually, I was adjunct faculty at Michigan Theological Seminary. And the thing I disliked the most about it was grading papers. And so I never gave any quizzes. I had everything writing on one long-term paper at the end. And then I had this humongous 30, 40-page paper I had to read for every one of my students. And then I said, I don't even like that either. I just like the teaching part. I don't like the grading part. But today I've got a pop quiz, okay? And it's in your bulletin under the sermon notes. So you want to get that out? There's a pen probably in the pew in front of you somewhere so that you'll be able to take that quiz. Before we do, I want to give you a little bit of review about the book. Maybe this will help you with your pop quiz, okay? And so this is it. Some form of the word no is used 41 times in this little book in the New International Version. If you read some other translations, they might have acknowledge or something like that a little differently. But okay, So 41 times. Now, because there's only 105 verses in the book, okay, that means about every two and a half verses, the word no is in there. This book is about God wanting you to really know something. All right? And we've looked at a lot of topics. Today it is God really wants you to know about assurance. <clears throat> you know the difference between the Calvinist and the Arminian. The Arminian, because the Calvinist has a, a tulip. It, a tulip stands for, the T stands for one word, U-L-I-P. And the last one is perseverance of the saints or assurance, okay? And so they got the tulip. Well, then the Arminian doesn't believe in that assurance. So they have what is called the daisy. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. And that's not the way it is. God gives us assurance. Assurance. All right? Now, he gives us assurance of eternal life. So I got three questions today, and they're really important. The first question that's on my quiz is, and it only starts out in the bulletin with, have you come, something like that. But this is the full question. Have you come to the place in your life where you can say that you know for sure that if you died today, that you would go to be with God forever? And there is just two answers to that question. Either yes or no. And I know sometimes people will say, but I don't know. Well, did you notice I said, do you know for sure? <laughs> So if you said, I don't know, then that means you don't know for sure, and you've got to check that box, no. This is pop quiz. I'm helping you with your answers. <laughs> All right, so i got to follow it up with a second question, because most people don't know. Honest to goodness, most people don't know. You see, as part of my introducing uh, a conversation uh, on the gospel, I will use this question a lot of times. I, I frame it a little differently, but it gets the same answers. And I find that most people don't know for sure, whether or not they have eternal life, that they'll go to be with God forever. Even though the whole purpose of this little, gospel, this little epistle of John is so that you might know. Watch what it says here and where we're picking up this week in our study. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. He's not saying that you might hope to know, uh, you might think you know, feel you know, but that you might really know that you have eternal life. And it is to the one who believes in his name. I hope you noticed that. Yes, the person who believes in his name should be answering that question, yes. May, may not be, because they may not have the assurance. But if you believe in him, you should have the assurance. That's why he's written this book. Let me go to another question. My second question that I have today on this pop quiz is, suppose you did die today. Now that is, I'm not wishing that on anybody. <laughs> but suppose you did die today and you stood right before God. Now that's a lot better, right? You die and you went to heaven, you're right there before God. And God said to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say to God? 
Now, I've left some blanks there. I want you, I'm going to take a pause. I'm pausing, so you'll actually write down, what would you say to God? Once you got something written down, I want you to raise your hand so I know. Okay, we got one written down. Two. Somebody else. So you got three, four, five. They're coming. Six. Yes, another, another. Got another, another. Good. They got an answer. Got an answer written down. Fantastic, fantastic. Good. Study show. Men do not like to write down an answer in the presence of women because they don't want somebody saying they had the wrong answer and embarrass them among women. Among men, it's okay. But among women, no, because they don't want to be diminished. There's, it's a pride thing. Go ahead, guys. Write it down. Go ahead. Write it down. You can do this, all right? I'm not collecting your papers at the end of this pop quiz. All right, here we go. Suppose you did die today and you stood before God and he said to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say to God? That's an important question. So I said fill in the blank. Here's some of the things I typically get. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. All right. Another one they write down. Well, I was baptized when I was a baby. I'm, I'm a Christian. Here's another one. I'm a church member. I'm a church member. I go to, and they tell me what church they go to. Hmm. Here, here's another one. I'm a tither, or normally I'm a giver. I, I'm a give. I'm a very giving person. Very giving person. Wow. Here's another one. I'm a moral person. You know why? I keep the Ten Commandments. All right? I'm, I'm, I'm a good person. Whew. I attend church. <laughs> right? Now, all of these are the wrong answer. They're good answers. They're just the wrong answer. And so if it were the gong show, they'd hit the gong. Gong, wrong answer. Or if you're in one of the, the, the daily uh, shows, of, uh, game shows, it, there'd be a buzzer going off. Eh, wrong answer. Wrong answer, okay. You see, the right answer is there's only one answer. There's only one answer to this that gets you into heaven. And it's found in the verse before, verse 12. He who has the Son has life. Wow. And he who does not have the Son does not have life. This is the answer. You either have him or you don't. You can be doing all those things I just said and not have the Son and wind up without Christ forever in hell. That's the truth. I'm just laying it out the way the Bible lays it out. He who has the Son. Now, I, I would have written down, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Or I might have put, I asked Jesus to come into my heart. Because that's what I did when I was eight years old and accepted Christ as my Savior. You, you might write down, I made a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Or you might put, I believe in Jesus, that he died, he buried, and he rose again. Those are all correct answers because they are about he who has the Son has life. He has life. But he who does not have the Son does not have life. I want to give you this assurance today. If you have accepted Jesus Christ in the great confession that he is the Son of God, he is the Son of God, and that he has come into the world, according to John 3, 16, and died for our sins, then you have the Son, and you have life. That's the assurance. My question three, I got it on there, is this. Do you have Jesus? That's the question. I can't answer that for you. I can't check it off. Only you can check that one off. Do you have Jesus, yes or no? Wow. That's where the assurance comes. Watch. Jesus said, On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And did we not cast out demons in your name? And do many deeds of power in your name? That's like miraculous deeds in your name. And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. Why? Because no matter all those good things they've done, whoo, 
if they've never ever confessed their sin and asked the Lord Jesus Christ to be their Savior from their sins, they are as lost, they're just lost people doing a lot of good things. Instead of being regenerated, they have reformation. They reform their life. But regeneration is not reformation. Reformation is making changes on the outside. Regeneration is God the Holy Spirit changing you from the inside out. Depart from me. I never knew you. They did not have the Son. They had all these wonderful good things and they looked good on the outside, but they were not Christians on the inside. I have some bad news for you today, and I've got good news. I normally say it the other way around. I've got good news and bad news. But today I said bad news because I want to talk about the bad news first, and the bad news will make the good news all that much better. And here's the bad news. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. Here's the good news. The bad news is we're all going to die for our sins. Every time I do a funeral, I point to the fact that here is the living or dying proof that we're all sinners. We all die. Death. All right? It's a consequence of sin. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look at it. It's eternal life. Eternal life is something God gives as a gift. So I got that list of all those things that I would do. Remember the question I asked? Where, what would you say to God to let you in? Doing good, being a good person, moral, having been baptized, member of the church. All that is good, good works that we do. But that's not what saves us. That doesn't get us eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life, and it's found in Christ Jesus, and we have to make him our Lord. So how do we make him our Lord? That's the question. How do we do that? It's very simply. I put a mouth on the thinker. Did you notice that? Because it's more than just the head thoughts. Listen, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. There's got to be a confession. Look down further. I've got to highlight it. With your mouth, it is that you confess and are saved. So it's got to be a verbalization, but it's not just a head thing because at, at, just responding to this, below this, it says, and you've got to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You confess because deep in your heart, with all your heart, you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. For with the heart, you believe. And you, it says, with your heart, it is that you believe and are justified or made righteous before God. Some people miss heaven by 12 inches. The distance between their head and their heart. They miss heaven that much. They know the facts. They even do good things. But it's not about our head. It's about our heart. Have you given your heart to Jesus? We live by faith, not by sight. So let's rule out the whole head thing, the sight thing. We live by faith. And somebody said, well, that's just blind faith. I said, yep, it is. It's a blind faith. I totally, blindly, I don't, I don't live my, my life of faith by what I see, but what I, what I hear. So you say, well, exactly how does this blind faith work? I, I got an illustration for you. I was surfing online, and I came across this article, The Thrill of Skiing Blind. There is an organization that goes to a different ski slopes and this one just so happens to be I think it's the one Sugarloaf in Maine and there they take blind skiers listen some are visually impaired don't see very well and some are totally blind and uh, one of them I found their testimony it works like this I am totally blind and usually the guides that I ski with are trained with visually impaired students said Sarah They'll ask, what do you, uh, uh, they'll, they'll ask you what your vision is like. Well, hers is totally blind. And the best way for you to be guided, that works for me. They'll usually say, left, hold, 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 as I'm going across the hill. Go straight, downhill, sharp turn, if they want me to do more abrupt turns. And she says, you, you know how she's skiing? 
She's skiing blind. <laughs> totally, totally in the trust of the guide. The guide's words. She's not trusting anything. Not sight, not... She's totally in trust of what the ski instructor is telling her. I think there's a great illustration for our faith. It comes, it's like this. Faith comes from hearing the message of the gospel, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. The word of Christ is found in your Bible. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Listen, faith is a total trust in the word of the guide. I trust the word of God. I trust the voice of Jesus. I trust him. I trust him. Blind faith? Blind. But my faith is as good as my guide. He will never mislead me, never misguide me. All I have to do is listen to my guide. That's faith. When you really have him, it's like this. Whoever has the son, because they have him as their guide, he has life. And whoever does not have the son does not have life. We have assurance of eternal life in Jesus Christ. We do. When you have him, you have eternal life. This all sounds a lot to me like John 3.18. How many of you got John 3.16 memorized? Okay. All right. Yeah, we all have that. Good, good. 17 down to 18, it says, whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whew. I believe I'm not condemned. I've got that faith where I trust in his word. I believe him. I'm not condemned. Whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of, the, of God's one and only son. You can, there's only two categories. Either you believe or you don't believe. That's it. Whew. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life. Whoever rejects the son will not see life for for the wrath of God remains on him. Listen, John 3.36 sounds a lot like John 3.18, which sounds a lot like 1 John. John 5.24 puts it this way. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has already crossed over from death unto life. I already have eternal life. So when this body dies, I don't die. I go to be with the Lord forever. I'm assured of that. This is the word of the Lord. Listen, there are more of the same in John 10, 28 through 30. It says, and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. This is as strong a negative as you can possibly get in Greek. They will never in no wise possibly perish. <laughs> is the way I would put that in our culture. No one can snatch them out of my hand. It's like, Jesus has us in his hand. Kind of like I got the remote in my hand. Jesus has us in his hand. And then he says, listen, and my father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my father's hand. You are doubly secure in our great God because my father and I are one. Wow. We are eternally secure when we have Jesus. When we have Jesus. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Not only do we have assurance of eternal life when we know Jesus, but we have assurance of prayer. I call it confidence. This is the confidence we have approaching God. That if anyone asks anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. Listen, in Hebrews, the author of Hebrews puts it this way, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness. I have confidence to go into the very presence of God and pray. Do you realize you don't have to go to a confession booth and confess to a priest in order to confess your sin to God? You can go directly to him. Anywhere, anytime, any place. Do you know you can make your request to God without coming to the pastor or even putting on a prayer chain? But if you want multiple prayers for that, you better put it on the prayer chain or put it in a bulletin. You know, fill out the green card, the church card. Listen, he says, we have this confidence. We, we have an assurance 
of answered prayers, we get answers because He hears us. He hears us. Notice it says, He hears us. Us. One of the shortest prayers in the Bible, I think, was Peter walking on the water. Remember that? There was a storm. You ever had a storm in life? Winds howling, blowing, and uh, but he sees Jesus, and Jesus is walking on the water, and they're all afraid. He says, don't be afraid. It is I. He said, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come out on the water. And so Peter does. He jumps out on the water. I would have said, you go, Peter, you go. <laughs> He gets out on water, he's walking along, and he takes his eyes off Jesus because of all the care surrounding him, the wind swirling, the, the rain being driven by the wind, the splash, the waves, and all of that. It's all got his attention. He takes his eye off of Jesus, and he begins to sink. And then he says the shortest prayer, I believe, is in the Bible. Lord, help. Lord, save. <laughs> Two words. And he grabs him by the hand. Oh, you have little faith. Pulls him out of the water. Listen. You can go directly to him and you have this assurance. He hears you. There is a qualification, though, according to his will. When you ask according to his will, sometimes we know what the will of God is and sometimes we don't know what the will of God is. Sometimes we know what the will of God is because we know that it will... Well, when you pray like... Uh, Paul prays in prison that God will give me a bold opportunity to speak in my incarceration. Uh, you know that is God's will, that you always speak boldly for Christ, right? He didn't pray, hey, hey everybody, pray that I'll get sprung out of here. Just think how much more effective I could be out of prison than I am in prison. No, he's praying, God, make me effective right here where I'm at in this circumstance under these, this, 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 uh, a domination by the Romans. He said, Lord. You see, he was praying according to God's will. And James says, you have not because you ask not. And when you ask, you ask amiss that you might consume it upon your own desires, your lusts, your own cares. Sometimes I wonder why certain things happen. Don't you? I'm driving along and my tire blows out. <clears throat> One year I was coming to serve for open door and I had a flat tire right down on Hiller Road and so I had to pull over and I called to have because I didn't want to be all dirty I called AAA but AAA told me it would be a half hour to an hour before they ever got there I said I didn't want to spend that much time so I jumped out and I got all the junk out you know the car and then I got my Wrenched there to take off the tire. I took off the tire. I put the donut on, threw it back in. I was a little dirty, dirty, and I came, and I served for open door that day. And then, well, I did call them, tell them I, I, I fixed the tire myself so they didn't have to come and do that. Sometimes we ask, why in the world did I have an incident like that that delayed me? I don't know other than somebody else must have stood, jumped in to do what God wanted them to do in my place. I don't know. I don't know why it is that some are struck with COVID and have a bad case and others have a simple case. I don't know. Other than that, that bad one is now going to have a testimony when they finally come through that I pray to the Lord God Almighty and I believe he healed me. And it opens up a conversation, what? To be bold in the witness for Jesus Christ. You see what I'm saying? We have to ask according to his will. And I don't always know what that is. And so, Lord, I ask that you be glorified. That is his will and what I'm going through. Listen, the key to answer prayer is having confidence to go before God, knowing that he hears us when we pray according to his will if anyone sees his brother and commits a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray that God will give him life. This is an interesting passage. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. Did you see that? A sin that leads to death. 
I am not saying that he should pray about that. What he was really saying, there is a sin that leads to immediate death. Immediate death. The wages of sin is death, so all sin leads to ultimate death. But every now and then there's a sin that leads to immediate death. I'm not praying that, 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 saying that you should pray for it. He says, all wrongdoing is sin. There is a sin that does not lead to death. Now, all the way through this, if you were following the new Revised Standard Version in the pews, you would find it would be saying, all wrongdoing is sin, and there is a sin that is not mortal. Did you ever hear of mortal sins? Mortal sins? Some have tried to make a doctrine out of this and categorize which are mortal sins and which are venial sins. Mortal sins are worthy of death and sins on that are venial are those that are not worthy of death. And the Bible says all sin, listen, all wrongdoing is sin and the wages of sin is death and so they're all mortal sins. But what he is saying here, some may lead to an immediate death while others don't. I can give you a case. Ananias and Sapphira committed a mortal sin. Remember that in the book of Acts? Ananias and Sapphira? You know what their sin was? They lied. Ooh! Come on here. I'm going to ask right now. Who here has never lied? I didn't see a single hand go up. <laughs> I knew there wasn't going to be any. We've all committed a sin, but the great grievance here was they committed a sin of lying against the Holy Spirit, lying to God, lying. And God intruded in time with judgment. He didn't wait and suspend it to the end. He, he, he brought judgment immediately. He punished them for that lie right then and there on the spot. He's saying, listen, there is a mortal sin, one that is an immediate judgment, and I would not pray that upon anyone. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. All sin is a sin that leads ultimately to death, but not all leads immediately to death. Then he turns and he says, listen, you have assurance of eternal life. You have assurance of answered prayer. You have assurance of being God's child. That comes when we stop practicing sin. Wow. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. Now, this is that present tense again in the, in the Greek language, and so it has a continually idea going with it. So we know that anyone born of God does not continually practice sin. They may stumble and fall, but they're not continually practicing it. They may be struggling, it keeps pulling them down, but then they get up and pray and say, God, forgive me for what I have done, because they don't want to practice it, and God forgives them of their sin. And if, over time, over time, they are weaned off that sin, and they stop practicing. Can they still fall and stumble? Yes, you bet. But it is not their daily practice to sin that sin that so easily besets them. The one who is born of God keeps himself safe. Listen, I, I keep a distance. And the evil one cannot harm him. Why? We're secure in the hands of Jesus and the Father. We have eternal life. He deals with us as a child and not as one who is not. Assurance comes from being God's child. It comes from living apart from the world. We know that we are children of God and that the world is under the control of the evil one. We are not under the control of the evil one. Remember what he said? Greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. So I, I have this tension in my life. God is in my life telling me one thing and the world is having its pull upon me because I'm not yet glorified in a glorified body that resists it completely. And I have this struggle in my, in my soul, in my heart, in my, my mind. And it says, but we know that we are the children of God. And that's why I say, I'm a child of God. Get there behind me, Satan. Well, I say, I'm a child of God. I cast all my care upon God, on Christ, on his word. I don't have to be controlled by you. I can say no to sin, Titus 3, 2, 3, 5. I can say no, I'm not going to do that. 
I take control. Why? Because I've got the power of God working in me. Listen, it comes from living apart from daily practicing sin, apart from the world. I've noticed this about Christians. When a person comes to faith in Christ, it doesn't take long until their friends know and those of the world, they separate from the Christian because they don't want you. You don't have to separate from anyone when you live for Jesus. It just comes naturally. It just comes naturally. Assurance comes also from knowing Jesus. That's where it comes from. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding. <sighs> he illumines our minds so that we may know Him. Not know about Him, but know Him personally, who is true. And we are in him who is true. Even in his son Jesus Christ, he is the true God and eternal life. Since Jesus Christ is eternal life, if you have him, you have eternal life. And that's what Romans 6.23 says. The gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. It also comes from living like his kid. He says, dear children, uh, he's talking to his kids, keep yourself from idols. Don't live like the world. Live like a child of God. Live like a child of God. Wow. I want to come back to the three answers you gave. What you really know, th th this is uh, the answers to the quiz. <laughs> if you died right now and you went to heaven and God said, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? I would say, I know Jesus Christ died for my sins, was buried, and rose again. I accepted him as my Lord and Savior at eight years old. I became a child of God. I am eternally secure in Jesus Christ, my Lord. Suppose you stood before him and said that. Do you know for sure? Yes, I know for sure. If you stood before him, yes, I know. Do you really know him? Yes, I know I really know him. I really know him. Those are the questions. Why? 1 John 5, 13. I write these things to you who believe. Do you believe? In the name of the Son of God? So that you may know that you have eternal life. Wow. That's the word of the Lord today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, there perhaps is someone here who checked off a no in that column. They don't know you. I pray right now they change that for eternity. And right now they say, Lord Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sins. I believe that you died, you were buried, and you rose again with eternal life. You ascended into heaven and you will impart that eternal life to all who believe. And I believe. Lord, we know anyone who prays that means it from their heart that you will save them from their sins. You will change them from the inside out. They will have assurance of everlasting eternal life. Assurance that you are God who answers our prayers. They will have assurance that they are a child of God. Assure us, O Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.